So we have the board out of the shell and on the bench here. And as you can see, this is slightly different than the schematic. Uh, the chips here are directly bonded to the board. So they're just simply covered with this epoxy and we can't probe the pins, which is unfortunate. But we can see it has the similarities of the schematic whereby uh, the sound will come out of this chip, likely up here somewhere, and come around. And then we have the two capacitors here and the two resistors here and the volume wheel here. So in terms of coming out of the CPU, I'd expect it to be very similar pin layout. So we are likely going to see these signals here. These two points are very likely the audio signal. Uh, and like I say, they'll come down to here. So we can test with a multimeter to find that out. So my presumption will be this part will be one of these two. Yep, yeah, there we go. So that one's one. And this other one here is likely going to be the other pad, which it is. So we can see there now the very first port of call is these two pads here should have audio on. They should come into these capacitors, go through these resistors and go to the top two legs of the volume wheel. And then the two legs below it are the output. So we, sh so we should see audio in here out these two. After that, if you remember, it goes over to the amp, which will be under here. You've got the smoothing caps for the amps. Uh, we've also got a bit of damage here, which might be significant on it, but as mentioned, we'll actually probe this to see. These two caps are in the same place. These will be the um, capacitors to ground on the output going to the headphone jack, which will come down and go to this connector here. So we have audio headphone out one and two, a ground pin, and the pin that signals whether uh, the headphones are connected, which should be grounded, and then this goes down to the actual headphone connector. The physical connector we're on about that's usually damaged and bad is this one here, the spring connecting this ground to here. We could go ahead and just test that and potentially fix the issue. But as I mentioned, I want to show you tools of how to diagnose this. So with that said, let me just bring in one thing. Now I am working on getting uh, to be official distributor of most products that you guys will need to diagnose things. So I've already got a uh, status of official uh, reseller of the DS Logic logic analyzers. Uh, I'm now also a supplier of the Pico Scope range of Pico Scopes. Um, what I try to do is find the tools that cost you the least to get you the most. So with oscilloscopes in particular, I've always used Pico Scopes as well as um, what else have I got? I've got Regals. I've got uh, I think it's Talonix. I've got quite a few uh, oscilloscopes. I always fall back to picoscopes in terms of what I feel is quality for the signal. Uh, but I've always used much more expensive ones. So if I just bring in the one I typically use, uh, which is here, it's a 6 series, so a 6402D. Now you can see the size difference uh, as well as weight difference. These are completely different beasts. Uh, but this thing is my general scope for seeing almost anything I need to. However, it costs a lot. It costs a couple of thousand pounds, if not more. I can't even remember. Uh, so what I did was I ordered a bunch of oscilloscopes from everywhere. So I ordered the cheap Chinese things. I ordered the mid-range. I ordered £100, £200, uh, £50. I kind of went everywhere. Uh, what I learned from that by actually using them on Game Gears and Game Boys and trying to find out what works is... 100, I don't even know if I've got it here with me. Um, yeah, I do. I've got one here, for example. Um, this one is apparently at 100 megahertz. This was actually the best of all the ones I tested for a knockoff. And you can see it actually says 100 megahertz there. Uh, I can tell you now this is about one megahertz. Um, so, and this is the best of the ones that I've tested. So I was originally going to recommend this one as you know, the, the roughly a hundred pound range to 200 pound ranges um, oscilloscopes. But before I did that, I thought, well, maybe the decent makers of oscilloscopes have something within a price range. So the actual budget picoscopes, in this case, this is the lowest model. I think this one's actually one up. I think it's 2205, uh, which is 25 megahertz. Um, I'm also selling and personally just recommending at the minute the 10 megahertz, the, um, 2204s. So you'll find the 2204s on our website now to buy. 
and even though they state the 10 megahertz, they perform better than the apparent 100 megahertz ones. I've also tested this on a 30 megahertz signal on the Game Gear, and you can actually see the 30 megahertz clock signal on a 10 megahertz scope. So when you pay a company like Pico Technology that know what they're doing and make genuine good products, uh, I've found that the, the lowest range, which is not that expensive, is more than adequate to diagnose all of retro consoles and to be able to see and use them. So if you're going to go for an oscilloscope, which after gain a bench power supply and a multimeter, I'd say your next thing you should buy is an oscilloscope. These things are endlessly useful for diagnosing anything past the basics. So without an oscilloscope, there's so many things you can't do, see, or test. So I'm going to show you, we're going to use this now, and I'm going to show you how you can find and track whatever this audio signal is, as well as just tracking um, what's happening so you can see it on screen. So let's just get some power to this board. And we are going to need a game in, but the game, as you see, is going to block most of the pads. So I'm hoping that these signals reveal um, the initial ping on Mario so you can see something changing. So we've got power on the board. If we connect it this way. That's not too bad. Uh, let's try this way. Don't want the wires getting in the way. There we go. So we have power there. Turn on. Yep, and this board's booting. So here we have the Picascope. I will show you how to use this, um, but for now, let me just quickly set it up. Channel A, 10 times scope, and working probably five volts will show us where we need to. So that will do for the minute. Time scale with audio, I'd probably recommend five milliseconds. So don't worry too much about setting up the scope. I will do more dedicated video videos on using scopes. But in general, connect the ground probe of the scope to ground. And then I've pulled the end off that scope, so we have like a needle pin. And you can see, if we touch there, it's just a sine wave off my body. So what we have now is we've got the Game Boy here. If we turn it on, or if I probe here, which should be the first point, the video output signal. If I turn on, you can see we're actually driving above. I have my scope set up right. There we go. So if I turn off and on, you can see the signal is actually just high. There we go. And see that pulse then when it beeped? If we try the other channel, turn it off, turn it on, and wait, we can see the pulse. So this works differently than the GBA. I've personally actually never probed the GBO yet, so this is the first time looking at it. I just know what I should expect to see. So from that we can see we do have signal coming out. Now I'm not going to presume that signal is wrong, even though to me I would have expected it to potentially pull all the way down, not just partially. It's probably because you've already got the way this system filters. So I'm happy that something's happening there when the game loads and the Nintendo falls down. That will be the ding sound. And we know it comes to... Zoom in a bit, I can see a bit more. We know it now comes to this capacitor, which is the exact same point, but for validation that the traces aren't broke, let's probe here and watch for the same thing. And there you go. So we know the signal's made it to here. And all I'm doing is turning the console on and off again um, to wait for that beep. So off and on. And let's see if we get that beep. And you see the other side now after the capacitor has been DC blocked. So now it's back to zero so if you see the line there that zero volts and up here is like five volts so before the capacitor the output is high it's like five volts after the capacitor the output is low at zero volts so the point of this capacitor is to dc block remove the dc signal uh, and gate on the baseline after that i believe the signal came through this resistor so again it should be exactly the same as what we've just seen it should go ground and then spike up on the ding there we go. And this is a better way, instead of checking continuity, say, from here to here, all continuity tests is, is the resistance low? So is the resistance less than 50 ohms? But when you're dealing with small audio signals like this, having a signal less than 50 ohms doesn't mean it's necessarily good. 
the scope will show you if the real data is actually coming through uh, and you can see it. So it's a lot more detailed than just a continuity test. So we now check the next stage, which is the opposite side of the resistor. We still see the audio. After that, we believe it went into the volume wheel here. So let's do that again. There we go. Now we can check the right side. And I can uh, get it so I'm not completely covering the camera. Rounds come off. Right, there's the other audio channel. And you can see we're getting the signal. So we're getting valid audio signal out of the CPU, which is good, into the volume wheel. Now the ones below the volume wheel will be the output of uh, when you turn the volume wheel up and down. So this is going to be hard to show. See that signal is smaller. But let me just jump onto the scope and make this a bit more valid signal. And let's just flip, put a game in and flip this over so that we can play with the audio wheel while it's turned on. So I'll get this into view. So we know here's the audio wheel and here's the pins. So again, that was audio in and in and out and out. So now if we turn on the console, and I probe, we get this. But now we should hopefully get some barrier music. I can't remember whether this game will just start playing audio or whether we have to get into the game first. I should have got Tetris really because that's a good, um, a good one to get audio straight away. Let's just wait and see if the game makes any audio by default. Nope, this game is not going to make sound without pressing a button. Let me just try Mario and Yoshi. And if not, I'll go and grab Tetris because I know that just starts without having to mess. It will just start playing audio. There we go. So Mario and Yoshi is now loading and you can see now here, here's the audio. So let me just set this up so it's a bit clearer. So we have the audio signal here is a one volt. So if I just reduce the voltage on here to make that signal a bit bigger, we can see there's the one volt signal. I can make it slower in time so you can see sort of a, a periodic audio. Or you can make it quicker in time to see it wider. So you can see it's like a digitally synthesized audio, which is exactly what Game Boy is. So I tend to look at audio at about five milliseconds. And this is now zero is the middle line and you're seeing the one volt peaks. So if I then go to the output and move the volume wheel, we can now see clearly the volume wheel working. There's zero. And as you increase the volume wheel, it increases the signal back to full strength. So that's proven that the CPU is outputting audio. We're receiving channel one there, channel two there. The output from the volume wheel, we go to about halfway. It's output there and output there. So you can see now how clear and easy it is to see that we have working audio up to this point. And we can actually see the signal and we're 100% confident we have good connection up to here with real data. So what happened next then? The signal went from the volume wheel over to the amp. Now the amp is the other side and we flip over. We're not gonna see much on the amp because of here. But what you do recall, I don't know, this can be pretty tricky to try and get. Let me just move these wires out again. Is these capacitors here were the output to the headphone socket, if you remember. So we touched on there. and we turn the volume up and down. We don't seem to be getting output on the headphones. And if we touch there, no output on headphones. So, we can turn back over. And I don't know whether when headphones aren't inserted, whether you, it doesn't output the audio. But we have pin 20 on this connector, which pin one starts here, I believe. Yeah, and there it says 21. So pin 20 here is the speaker output. And you can see on this also, we're not getting any output. 
So the amp isn't outputting. And for this, we're going to have to remove the gain because it's in the way, which means we can only work on the pulses and not a constant audio signal. But that's fine. We can still do that and still make use of it. And if you remember on the uh, schematic, the audio comes from the volume wheel, which is here, comes out and goes over to pin 7 and 8, I believe it was, or whichever the two pins were roughly here. These are likely these two lines here. And there's actually no way of probing into there. But what we could do is do continuity from the volume wheels here. Or we can just lightly scratch off a bit of resist. So the probes can probe the line underneath. And we will see if we get the same audio signal from the volume wheel, which I now know point of that half voice that we see. So if I probe this pad, turn on, let's see if we see the audio bing. There we go. So that is the line, and I presume this one is the other line. And let's wait to see if we get the bing, which it wouldn't really matter if we didn't because the other one's going in. So we know now, and we can presume that going into the amp here, we have the two valid signals. So we have the audio into the amp. Now, out of the amp, there was the headphones and the speaker. If I grab the working Game Boy, what I could do now is validate if whether the headphones are plugged in or not, do we see headphone output? Because the headphone output, which that's now in the way, turn around, the headphone outputs come out down here. So even though we tested the capacitors here, uh, which I'm sure were, um, just following this trace around, Maybe that isn't the capacitor on this. I'm making the presumption that these were the capacitors for the filtering. Maybe it was this one, and maybe it's different on this board. But what we do know is the headphone outputs were down here. So let's just probe this one, turn off and on, and see if we get any signal. So we're not getting any signal at all on the uh, headphones. Let's just double check we still have it up here. There we go. And we're also getting none on the speaker output, the pin 21. So that would lead us to think that either this amp isn't getting power, which is hard to see again here, but I'm guessing this is the power, because there's the big trace from the power switch, which comes down, goes to here. So we turn on, you can see we do have power because it's you can see the uh, little red flag on the scope here goes to over range because we're zoomed in at the minute to like one volt. So the presumption is this chip is getting power. This is much easier when the chips are exposed. You can actually see. Let's just probe around and see if we're getting anything else anywhere because this is a smoothing cap and we don't seem to be getting any voltage there. And out of curiosity, Let's see if it's, because we're getting nothing out of the amp, let's see if this pin is grounded. So for that, let me just grab testers for continuity. And let me just quickly, there we go. we'll go to ground and touch on here. So that pin isn't actually grounding, and it should be grounding. And it's not. Yeah, my testers are working. So we do actually have a fault on the headphone socket because this pin here isn't grounding. So we could bypass this pin, or we could fix the problem itself, which is by fixing this here. So that means this connection here isn't grounding, and you can see it physically isn't. So if we zoomed in, and I've done this in the GBA video, here should be ground. And here should be ground. So we want to test that with continuity to ground. And then this spring, you can see, should be touching there to make it ground. When we insert headphones, which of course I don't have on me at the minute, uh, you can see it moves it away like that. So you can see that pad gets pushed away. But when it's not in, it's also not making contact to ground here. 
So we need to make that make contact to ground. So we can simply bend it in like this a bit if we want, or we can get the tweezers in between and basically scratch away any corrosion between the two pads and get some IPA and dunk that in there and scratch away and then push that in and now let's see if we have ground connection because at least if we get audio coming out of the speaker signal then we know there we go now we have ground so with having ground now we should definitely expect to see audio out of the speaker pad we can come back to the fact that the headphones never had audio anyway um, after this let's just flip this board around uh, probe pin 21 which was this one i believe for the speaker and turn on and let's see if we get a ding now on the speaker No, so let's do that once more. Nothing. So the fact that the amp is receiving the signal and the amp is getting ground on the pad, we would normally probe the amp directly but like i said this is making it very difficult because we can't actually get to the the chip to test the connections so we're going to have to default to i think continuity mode and finding if the ground wire from here uh, makes its way back up to the amp and we can look at the schematic to try and see where that is now if we remember on the schematic originally if this was the regular amp chip uh, the audio come in here and the speaker out came over here and it had a capacitor right here to ground so the very good chance is this is the speaker output right here coming out of the amp it then goes to this capacitor off up all the way up through under there all the way around down to this via if we follow that via around go somewhere under this pad here and then likely to here so we could remove this trace but for now let's try and get as close to the source as possible which means i think if we scrape this pad here a little bit that's right out of the amp itself and let's do one more test obviously if this was the amp we'd be probing directly now onto those pads that's what i want to be doing but we can't get to them to diagnose if the you know signals coming out of the amp or not directly but this is good enough so if we now touch on there and turn on do we get signal so we see nothing still no audio signal whatsoever and we should be getting it out of there so then we want to look at uh, the ground signal it tells the chip to come out of mute which was pin six and on the schematic it simply came underneath the amp with three trace wires and then through a via so if we make the presumption that it's also exactly the same and let's have a look where the amp is so the amp is here we flip over and there was a trace wire so it looks exactly the same it looks there is the ground plane this come up and here was pin six so now if we presume do we still get ground at the closest point to where the amp will be which is right here let's gently scrape that away let's get the multimeter let's go to ground and to ground there and you can see we're getting ground so without being able to physically probe the chip itself the presumptions we can currently make is based on this capacitor getting power here we presume the chips getting power because the very next step is to go into the chip we can presume the chip is operational which it might not be um, but we've got to make that presumption because all we know is it's got power 
and I presume it's got ground. There's no obvious signs of any kind of damage around the chip. There's no sort of rotted trace that we can see. Uh, everything seems generally good quality around the chip. And if we look this side, there's this bit of mess here. But we've already validated that the signal comes to here. So it's only got to make it to the very edge there. We could quickly just clean that up with a bit of IPA. But I'm 99% sure this is not damaged. This is just little bits of dirt and debris. So that seems all good there. We don't have to concern ourselves with where the signals go after the chip because we can already see coming out of the chip right here, which should be speaker, isn't getting anything. So as I mentioned before, the only thing between the speaker output and the physical pin is this capacitor. So the next step, I'm going to remove this capacitor to see if that's potentially damaged or pulling the signal low or affecting the signal in any way. We also want to just trace that line going up from here. Give it a clean all around to make sure there's nothing in the way of that signal. Nothing that looks untoward. And that all looks good. So let's just remove this cap and warm up the pads. And there we go, that's destroyed getting that off. It's just a basic capacitor that I've got spares of and I can replace, so I'm not too worried about that. It will also function without this capacitor anyway, just to prove if that is the issue. Just give that area a bit of a clean up. There's nothing between that output and the connector. So this is purely now, is the amp outputting um, any audio signal to the speaker, which it should do because it has power, it has the six pin grounded, and the next step is to output to this trace here. So now let's turn on, and my scope has gone. Why is my scope gone funny? There we go. Turn on, let's see if we get anything. Nothing at all. See if we get anything coming here, which we should should still see. So we still see the signal there. And the output of the amp, which should be here. Yep, we get nothing. So let's ignore the speaker output for the minute then. See if we can get headphone output. So I'm just going to insert a random extension lead into here for the purposes of just disconnecting that ground. But we already saw that ground was disconnected and faulty anyway. But still double check everything. So now with that, we want to see if we get headphone output. So instead of going down to the bottom again there, um, let's find the traces that come up and any components that go through them. And if we remember from the schematic again, the traces come up the inside here on the other side of the board so we go to the other side of the board it's these two traces so they obviously come off the connector here go up through here up through here up through there all the way this is a capacitor the other side here that we'll look at and it goes here into uh, the amp so the amp should be just the opposite side here which it is you can see the amps there. The other one carries on up. The capacitor is here. And it goes up and through and into the amp here. So these two signals, we should be able to check by the amp, say around here. This should be the closest point to the amp. And the other signal, probably around here, is the closest point to the amp. So 
So now let's power this board up again and see if we're getting signals at that point. If we're not getting signals there, what we want to do is probably remove the capacitors because they're the things also sitting on the line. Uh, we just want to see if the chip is actually operating and outputting any signals. So we turn on now. You can see we got absolutely nothing. So let's try this one. Make sure we have a good connection. Turn off and on. Once more, just to double check. And we get nothing. So the only real step left, because we've got to the point where it comes into the amp, the amp has power. Um, if we remove the headphone connector again, and just quickly check if we now have a good ground again on there. Yep, so the ground's now working, so we'd expect output on the speaker pad, which is this pad here, this trace. Um, the only thing we'd really do is probably remove these two caps, the smoothing caps, in case either one of them is dead. And then you'd have to make the logical assumption that um, one of the wires inside the amp uh, under that die is broken. If this was a more modern Game Boy, where that amp was physically on the board, we could also hot swap the amp with another one uh, to prove that, as well as being able to actually probe the pins easier. A lot of the limit of this board is the fact that it's directly bonded to the board. So not only can we not touch the amp, we also can't swap the amp to continue the diagnosis. We, we have one real option. But saying that, I think we found the problem just as I was doing this. Kind of hope we have. Um, look at that capacitor. <laughs> Does that look healthy to you? It's guts are hanging out the bottom. <laughs> That's a blown capacitor by the looks of it. Notice the other one, the base is on. This one, base twisted. Now, this could just be coincidence, this could be how it's positioned and bent down. But if that capacitor was dead, then the presumption that the power to the amp coming in here that we measured, making its way to the amp, could be wrong. So this is just a smoothing cap to the amp, so it's not that vital again to just get things up and running. So let's remove this one. We might actually be in for some luck. This might be uh, the problem with the board, that the amp is not receiving good power. And let's just clean that area up. Again, on the schematic, the power to the actual op amp was from this pin, but the opposite side. So we just flip over. and clean that mess up. Now you can see this is actually different than the schematic because the schematic had a trace um, from this power here, this pad here, straight into the amp. Now there's no trace here, so it's not getting the power from there. So we turn over. It's also got no trace here. So this should be receiving power. And if we look around here, I'd say it's this beer that probably just jumps here and goes into here. So let's just flip over. And you can see here's the beer. So this will be power coming in to here, which will go where we thought it did, to here. So we can safely assume power into the amp is also right here. So let's just gently scrape that off. And when we turn on, we can test that. So let's see where we're at now. Let's just put power back onto the board again. Get the scope. And if we go down here and probe right here when we turn on, you can see we get power. So now we know that it's gone. Let's just probe the output. Oh, and that now raised, that's a good sign. And bear in mind, this is the speaker output. And still unfortunately not, but if you notice when you turn off and on, see the slight raise in the output. So that before didn't change anything, now it's changing a bit. 
So that was probably a bad capacitor. So what we can see now then is really we have signals coming in to the amp we know work. Output to the speaker that should work or the headphones that should work that neither show anything. Uh, we've looked visually at all the traces around. Nothing looks damaged, but because the chip is embedded, we can't really change it to do anything further. So the last resort... Um, just looking if that was a trace or not. No. Um, the last resort really is to disconnect anything that's stopping the amp potentially working. So that would include uh, this capacitor, this capacitor, this capacitor, and the audio board down here. So we remove all external variants to try and let the amp just do what it wants to do. Now I know from past experience that the amp will still output um, signal, so you should still see audio signals without any of those components installed. If we want to see it on the speaker, we can then bridge these two back together. So this is the ground check that the headphones are in. So let's just bridge that because it's easier to check the headphone one. And let's just snip the ground legs of these capacitors. So that they're, they're easily resolderable. Just bend them up out of the way. Same for these, just snip one of the legs and just bend them up out of the way. So now there's nothing that should interfere with this amp's operation. It gets power in, it gets signal in, and it should try and output to the LCD connector, which let's just double check that isn't doing anything. We can do a quick check that, you know, for example, this um, LCD connector isn't pulling it to ground. No, just check they are working, yeah. So there's nothing necessarily pulling that to ground, which would cause an issue. Uh, we could check the outputs here aren't being pulled to ground. No. Nope. So as far as I can see, there would now be nothing at all on this board stopping this amp operating. Uh, we've done everything we physically can. We can check ground to the amp. And we could try and check these two signals, potentially what these are, which I think these two are ground anyway. Uh, there's quite a few ground connections to this amp, not just one. So I can't see it being a bad ground. Um, but that's the only thing I think we haven't checked. So let's just see if I can uh, scrape a little bit off these and see if these are ground pads. You'd think they'd just be joined if they were, though, with having two different pads. Uh, and I'll just double check the schematic in a second of what pads these are next to. So what it looks like is this pad is power, this is the input, this is ground, and this is the trigger to tell the amp to come out of mute, which should be ground, uh, because we've shorted it on the ribbon cable itself here. So it's just the connection to this ribbon cable. So let's just quickly check if that's right. See if we have ground on this one. which we do, and that one also. So we have ground going into both. So we can make the assumption the chip has ground, not to mute on this speaker output, has power going in and it has signal coming in, and it has no other components now connecting to it. So there is nothing left on this board we could now do, short of replacing this chip, which we can't do because we can't get to it. So let's just juice up now, because we've disconnected a few components, and see if that gives us audio. Alright then, so, we'll go through the double checking again. Uh, we turn on, and we should see audio signal come in here, which we do. Turn it off again. Uh, let's check we have power here, which we do. And let's see now if we get signal out on the speaker. which we don't. So there really is nothing left to do here. However, the good thing here, you might think, well, we haven't solved the problem, but we have technically solved the problem. What we've done is proven that everything going out of the CPU into the amp is good. 
all the traces coming out of the amp going to the locations are where they should be and there's no other components connected that would interfere therefore we can make the solid deduction that this amp is actually dead uh, you could go through the trouble if you really wanted to prove this we could just crack away all of this remove it all completely so the amp is not on the board and then solder one of the let me see if I've got one solder say one of these amps on and just hand wire every one of these to the original positions and we should get audio using the scope it's allowed us to see that we have signal coming in here and we should be getting signal out of here therefore it's not the front board it's not the connectors it's not the speaker it's not the the board connecting to the headphones we know the problem lies here in the fact that this is not outputting anything from the amp without a scope that would be impossible to see and we'd be making assumptions the scope has allowed us to absolutely and definitively identify the problem lies under here so the other thing we can do which is really useful is to grab another board so this is the exact same spec of board and we can do a comparison now so as well as the scope being able to see things we can now compare two different boards so here's a board where i presume it works haven't tested well, let's turn on you see the audio signal there and then it comes out we go say jump to the volume wheel down there turn off and on and we should see the audio come out the volume wheel yep we go over to the amp and I've just snipped everything off here the same so I've snipped every component as you can see this capacitor this one this one uh, this big one is snipped off and this one snipped off so we're simulating that the setup is exactly the same as our other board there's nothing connected to this amp except uh, the CPU and power if we check the signal into the amp we should see the signal coming into the amp and we do we should see the five volts there which we do ground and ground which we do and then on the speaker notice the sound is now actually at a 2.5 volt offset and there's the audio so it's actually setting a DC bias offset on the output. And that's this amp doing that. It's generating that 2.5 volt bias internally. We don't see that on ours. And now let's just double check the headphone connector. This is without headphones in. And you see we get nothing and we don't get a DC bias. Let's plug a headphone connector in. And let's test again. And you can see we get a 2.5 volt offset on the headphones only when the headphone connector is plugged in. So the expected behavior is we should be seeing a 2.5 volt DC offset on um, the speaker or the headphones. So this is with the headphone connector in. When I unplug the headphone connector, you can see that rises up. So this helps to also clarify that it's definitely the amplifier on the board that's the problem. And now instead of guessing and thinking what it could be or potentially where the issue is, we know with absolute certainty the issue lies here. That's the benefit of the scope and that's what it's allowed us to see and do and be assured that we know the problem. Um, and if we were to swap this chip, we would fix that issue. So that would involve cutting this chip off completely, grabbing a board, say, that has one of these amps on, and then hand wiring each leg of that amp to each trace on the circuit board. And I can guarantee you that would fix the problem. The question then simply comes down to, is this a worthwhile project? Uh, if the customer wants this and wants to pay for the labor to do it, it can be done. If there's any kind of sentimental value in maintaining the board, let me just put over the two boards out of the way and bring the customers back. So say this had a real sentimental value and they wanted this working. We could gut this chip here and we could solve it to all the wires, no problem. It would probably take an hour but that's where we're up to with this board. The amp here is clearly dead and has some fault. Uh, and the only way to replace it is to gut it and use an amp off another board. We could bypass the amp altogether and simply pass this signal in and back out. Or we could do a clean amp mod and we could tap into this audio input here, both audio inputs, and bypass this amp. So we could restore this by installing a clean amp, actually. And then just to quickly prove it, I've chucked on a clean amp. Uh, so a bit dirty but it's on there 
So we're obviously connecting to the headphone connector for disabling the audio when the headphones are plugged in, the power pin. I've just sold the ground straight to the ground pad. Uh, we have both left and right audio channels going in. So first channel into here, second channel into the top of the capacitor and the speaker just chucked on for now. And you can obviously see, flip it around. This is the board we're working on. So it's not been changed. This is the customer's board with no audio. We can turn that on now. You can see we have audio. So hopefully that's shown you the uses of using an oscilloscope to see the problem, not just make presumptions. You can find out with certainty where the problem is. You can use an existing working board to make your comparisons. And you can use techniques such as removing all components to get to the bare minimum required to get something working on that is not working. As we saw the audio going into the amp, and the amp very rarely dies, in this case it actually has died, the scope allowed us to prove that and to see it for sure that we're not just going randomly replacing components and trying different things. We knew what the problem was from looking at the scope. And then when we installed an amp, we knew it was going to work because the clean amp uses the input from the volume wheel. And we've seen the audio coming into the volume wheel. After that, it goes off to the old amp, which we don't care about because the clean amp bypasses it. So we've known the issue as opposed to guessing the issue. Hopefully the walkthrough of both the schematic, how I think and how I then physically go and solve problems will help you out. It's not always about solving the problem, it's about having the confidence to understand the problem more so than fix the problem. But most of the time you can always find out where the problem is and we have a solution to fix it. If anybody else has boards they want to see fixed live, just send them in to me and I'll repair them for free and I cover return postage. I'll see you guys in the next one.